any confusion, uh, if something was misheard, um, you can always go back to the recording itself. Uh, during the course of this webinar, if there is a question, uh, you can use the Q&A button at the very bottom to pose a question. Um, I won't be able to respond to it during the course of the presentation, um, but when we get to q and I'll have the questions queued up and we will be able to respond then. Um, some other norms and reminders. Um, reminding folks to ask concise questions. Um, there may be people who have tons of questions, so making sure that you ask concise questions so that everyone has a chance. Um, be mindful of your airtime. If you've already asked a question, make space for others to join in. Invite others to join in, but just be mindful of your airtime. Be mindful of your assumptions and challenge your assumptions. Um, assume positive intent. Um, and I always encourage uh, that we ask questions as a way to clarify so that we don't have to go into assumption land. Um, our objectives today are to introduce the public art portion of Abolitionist Place Project, uh, to share public engagement opportunities, and to respond to community questions about the project. So um, our agenda is the same agenda we um, had at our last meeting. Um, I'm going to do a quick overview of Abolitionist Place, an overview of the concerns that folks have expressed, um, an overview of the artists, that's me, um, the overview of the proposal for uh, the artwork in this location, and an overview of the public engagement opportunities. Um, and we may go a little bit quicker through this section uh, with the goal of leaving as much time as possible for Q&A. So overview of abolitionist place. Um, so this, um, as I've stated before, is taken directly from the EDC's website. Uh, the New York City EDC work at abolitionist place will be a 1.15 acre uh, street level public open green space in the heart of downtown Brooklyn, half a block from the vibrant Fulton Street Mall. Uh, many folks know this area because of Alby Square um, and several other things that used to be uh, in this location. Um, the project is part of the downtown Brooklyn redevelopment plan, um, a set of space and infrastructure commitments made in 2004 to reinvigorate the neighborhood and celebrate the area's unique heritage. Um, so this is directly from the website as sort of a, a description of how they're framing uh, the work that they're doing at the site. Um, this is a drawing or a sketch of the site um, with locations of trees and parks and other elements. I'm only responsible for the artwork. Um, I don't make any decisions regarding locations um, or structural elements like where seating is organized or where trees will be. And it's always important uh, to remind everyone um, that this public art product is part of a larger initiative uh, in pursuit of freedom, um, which was designed um, as an approach and an effort to explore Brooklyn's anti-slavery movement from the end um, of the American Revolution to the early days of Reconstruction. Um, and so there've been several iterations um, of this work from curriculum to performances, um, to exhibitions um, and things of that sort. Um, and so the public art portion is just one of the many projects that fall under the umbrella of In Pursuit of Freedom. As many folks know at this point, um, the city elected officials and community officials renamed Willoughby Square uh, to Abolitionist Place. Um, for many folks who've been following this project, uh, many of you remember when it was called Willoughby Square, uh, we're now calling it Abolitionist Place, so just keeping that um, at the front of our minds. <clears throat> so overview of concerns. Uh, this is the section where I like to be very transparent about the critiques people have had about my involvement in the project and the artwork that I've proposed. Um, so we're gonna go through them because it's better to like talk about things directly. Um, so first, I love critique. Um, this was the same thing I said last time um, and it still stands. We've had several conversations and meetings um, and readings and articles over the past few weeks. And so it's always good to read up on how folks are feeling, um, how people are framing the work. Um, and so we're gonna use this as sort of a jumping off point uh, to go into our Q and A, but also to frame sort of our next steps. So um, one of the, the elements that I'll start with is um, before we even get into what I'm proposing, uh, one of the concerns was that the work that's currently being proposed is not 
uh, figurative work um, and that it is important for the work to be figurative work. So there is a desire for figurative work or representational work of uh, a body or of a person um, in the belief uh, that the power of representation to create change. So this is one concern. People would like to see um, abolitionists represented in their physical form in this location. Um, there's also a concern that the community engagement is fake um, and that this element and part of the process is meaningless. Uh, so there's a deep concern that this is all performative. Uh, there's also concern that the work is co-opting abolitionist rhetoric. Um, and I think this comes out of um, some issues around uh, people not being happy about uh, me quoting uh, Dr. Ruthie Gilmore um, in relation to this project uh, and the, the assumption that I'm moving away uh, from the stated goals of the project um, by talking about abolition um, broadly um, relating to prisons and other things. Additionally, there's a belief um, that the ADC uh, and Camila, that's me, um, are the same people or that in some way I'm a puppet of the EDC. So there have been folks who've been talking about the ways in which um, this project is again, taking up this language uh, while demolishing things um, and that in some way I'm complicit in um, sort of co-opting uh, this rhetoric um, or that in some way EDC and I are in cahoots uh, to do something. Um, there's also a concern that I will make this project uh, solely about jails and prisons. Um, and there's a concern that, again, this is moving away from the abolitionist history of Brooklyn. Uh, there's also concern that this uh, work um, is too conceptual or too abstract, uh, and that I'm not the right person for this project. So you'll see in this excerpt here, um, this is a comment from the, a New York Times article, uh, which is discussing the ways in which the project retreats into art world mystification, um, and that possibly I need to take a step back and recognize that I'm not the right artist for this project. Additionally, there's a belief that me, <laughs> I, that I'm not invested in real change and I'm more focused on making work that I just happen to like. Um, this comes out of a statement that I made, which I still stand by, uh, which is talking about turning the idea of a monument on its head um, and my interest in sort of exploring uh, the history of monuments and exploring the ways in which uh, this particular project can actually be a valve um, or sort of an opening to talk about other ways uh, to commemorate uh, histories, but also to think through uh, possibilities for the future. Um, there's also concern that I'm out of touch <laughs> and that I don't actually understand uh, the situation in which I'm currently uh, rooted and seated. There's also concern that um, as a Black woman, um, that I'm some type of pawn to get people to be quiet um, about uh, pre-existing concerns. Um, and so the, these are some of the concerns. I'm sure there are more concerns that folks have about me being involved in the project, um, but I just wanted to share these elements. And so with that, I love critique, but I also uh, mostly <laughs> and, and entirely love informed critique even better. And so Part of the purpose of these presentations are to clarify where there's not clarification and to open a discussion where folks feel like there isn't the space for discussion. And so I wanted to do a quick overview of myself. Um, like I said, I'm currently in Hanover, Germany, and tomorrow I'll be in Berlin, uh, Germany. I'm in the middle of uh, installing two shows here um, and just wrapped up another one. Um, and we'll be going to Berlin after this uh, early tomorrow morning. Uh, for the next show. Um, and so with that being said, I wanted to share a bit about what I do as an artist. Um, I work mainly with language um, and that language can be both visual and text-based, but it's mainly text-based um, as a former high school teacher and as a current uh, instructor, instructor at the graduate and undergrad level, I'm really interested in uh, conversations around learning, conversations around text and the written word and the ways in which these can sort of be situated in public spaces. Uh, and so this is from a project um, organized by Four Freedoms uh, in the summer of 2020, I believe it was, uh, where we were sort of asked to sort of think through a series of questions um, that um, are really important and pivotal in our day-to-day -day life, but for larger communities. Um, and this is located in North Little Rock, Arkansas, um, and it reads, what have you unlearned today? 
And this is sort of a prompt uh, for folks to sort of think through not only the accumulation of degrees or knowledge or ideas, but also what does it mean to let go of um, habits, beliefs, uh, ways of being that are destructive uh, at an interpersonal level and also at a, at a larger structural level. There's also this project um, that opened at the end of 2020 at the Brooklyn Museum. Um, the invitation came at a time where this area of the museum had not been used by artists, but was mainly used for advertisements um, of current shows. And so with this invitation, I wanted to sort of think about, again, text, but also this invitation to read closely. Um, there are several uh, moments in looking at this text uh, based upon where you're located on the street, where some things are visible, some other things are not visible, but a larger question around what does it mean to read closely and what's gained in our process of exploring nuances um, in the day-to-day -day text that we read, but also the primary sources that we explore um, as students <laughs> of history, both in the classroom and outside the classroom. Uh, there is also this project at the Brooklyn Public Library in 2019 called Scoring the Stacks, um, and it was an invitation for folks to actually uh, roam through the library space to sort of explore new pathways. And so there were a series of prompt cards that asked people to go, for example, to um, the youth wing and find a yellow book and write down uh, a word they most recently used on the fifth page. And folks would drop these words um, or drawings or sketches into a larger box. And those materials will be used for future public programming where uh, literally a group of strangers would come together for 90 minutes to do one of three things, uh, to write and perform a song, to uh, write and perform a poem, um, or to choreograph and perform a dance. And so we did this over the course of several months in 2019. And the work was sort of framed by this banner, having abandoned the flimsy fantasy of certainty, I decided to wander. Uh, and again, this was an invitation to sort of think about a different choreography through um, the library space, again, as an invitation to think about what are things in the library that I may not traditionally uh, encounter or have an interest in, and how can this project actually lead people to sort of rub up against ideas um, or texts or books um, that they may not traditionally um, be drawn to. There is this project at the Venice Biennale in 2017, which is this very simple banner that reads, are we there yet? Um, and like I've, um, you may have noticed <laughs> with the work uh, that I have produced, I do like questions um, and I like these questions because I'm interested um, in sort of the subtext of the question, but I'm also very uh, invested in how people uh, sort of jump to respond to questions. Um, oftentimes, um, including myself, without considering the stakes or defining the terms of the question. And so with this question, are we there yet? There, 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 there are several conversations around who the we is um, and what the there is, right? So who is the we in this question? Uh, what is the there? Where are we actually headed? Um, and so I was really excited about this project because it being situated at the Venice Biennale, it was photographed a lot and people would respond and Instagram comments to say, like, yes, we were there, or no, we're not there. And so the debate that sort of ensued from this process was interesting to me because I think it revealed what we already know, which is that people of different subjectivities are experiencing the world differently. And so where someone might see a sense of progress or movement in a certain direction, other people may feel a sense of stagnation. Um, this is from a body of work at Brooklyn Museum as well. Um, they're actually still up inside the museum in the same location. There are four banners um, that ask questions around, are we there yet? After hope, then what? Is this the last time? Um, and did you think it would get easier after this? Um, and so the, the, the broadness of the questions allows for lots of engagement in terms of uh, how people want to enter the questions. But I'm really interested in political futures because I think that there is a lot of investment in certain ideas, particularly around hope. Um, around optimism, and I'm really curious um, and invested in exploring these ideas a bit more by posing these questions and having public programming where we're actually in discussion about um, notions of hope, notions of optimism, notions of progress. Uh, this is also at Brooklyn, uh, live, or excuse me, Brooklyn Museum. Um, as you'll see, there's a series of prepositions located on different areas um, of the stepped area of the step of the steps. <laughs> uh, and during the public programming for this, um, folks would identify a preposition they wanted to sit on 
um, and then would go through a series of questions with the partner. So for example, um, if you look at along, uh, one of the questions that was posed was, was uh, what are you willing to go along with? What are you not willing to go along with? Um, even sitting on the question on the preposition toward, um, what are we? What must we move toward? What must we move away from? Uh, this is from a project called Selling My Black Rage to the Highest Bidder, uh, which uh, again um, was an opportunity to actually engage with people. There's a number you could call, so people will pull off the tab. They would call this number and place a bid. And I was most interested in the ways in which um, people are so deeply uncomfortable with black rage and are so deeply uncomfortable with the notion um, of anger, um, of, of offense, uh, particularly when it comes from black folks who have a rightful uh, <laughs> gripe uh, with state violence. And so with this project, I was really interested in the ways in which um, everything from um, black power, you know, symbols and uh, clothing and aesthetics have become uh, monetized and commodified. And so I was interested in this notion of taking something intangible like an emotion such as black rage and bottling that and selling that to someone. Um, and also deeply invested in what the person receiving uh, this bottle of black rage felt like they now had in their hand. And so I'm interested in the relationships between anti-blackness and capitalism, um, but deeply interested in sort of these moments of social engagement where people are um, asked to, are given the option to uh, participate in a particular process and through that process being able to reveal uh, things around social relationships, uh, expectations, and then just desires as well. Um, there's also this project, How to Suffer Politely and Other Etiquette. Uh, this started in 2013, um, particularly in response uh, to a lot of things that were going on. But in particular, I was most interested um, in the killings of Black folks by police officers. Um, and of course, that was deeply traumatizing. Um, but what ended up being like immensely fascinating, but not, <laughs> not uh, unpredictable was in watching the news coverage, this emphasis on um, angry Black people uh, and their destruction of public property uh, and their frustration and just how uncomfortable Black rage and Black anger um, and outrage was causing other people to be. And so I really wanted to think about the relationship between etiquette and comfort um, in relation um, to, to the ways in which folks had responded uh, to Black pain, to Black suffering. Um, and so there are four banners lower the pitch of your suffering, uh, which was really interesting to me because I felt like during that time and still now, um, the expectation is that even if you are going through a traumatic situation um, at the hands of the state, the expectation is that you find a way to uh, be not as loud or upfront um, or abrupt or, or, or causing discomfort, right? Um, there's also take it like a man, but don't take it up with the man. Uh, there's tell your struggle with triumphant humor. So this, in, this interest for me and Black folks in relation to humor and entertainment and expecting us to keep that register even when we uh, are being offended um, or are harmed. Um, and then finally, purchase the proper boots with which to pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Um, this, pro, this, this one um, makes me chuckle a bit just because the notion of pulling yourself up by the bootstraps is such uh, a fascinating visual, um, but also thinking about this relationship between uh, notions of progress uh, and capitalism, again, the notion that you must purchase the accoutrements uh, for this, this impossible task. Uh, so you're still investing money in this process. Uh, there's also this uh, project, an alphabetical accumulation of approximate observations, uh, which came out of um, an interest in thinking about how to uh, take a lot of things I was thinking about at this particular moment from 2014 to about 2018, um, and sort of collapse them into these alliterative phrases. Um, so you have things like redacted rage, the notion of having rage, but then pulling it back, anachronistic anger. So a sense of anger that is sometimes some way out of, uh, out of place temporarily, um, obsolete outrage, your outrage is no longer useful. Um, moist machine, aggregate apathy, uh, lethargic legislation, which ends up being one of my favorite. Um, in my undergrad, I studied actually policy uh, and history, and one of the things that was most interesting about that experience was exploring the ways in which uh, legislation as written and legislation as implemented become two different things. And so uh, this language of lethargic legislation reminds me of um, the work that we have to do to not only pass particular laws, but to also 
um, have the structures um, in line uh, to ensure that that policy is implemented um, in a particular way. Um, this is from a project that uh, showed up in a gallery in LA and um, it involved carving, uh, the gallery folks carved into the wall um, for me, uh, which revealed all these little flecks of paint from previous shows. Um, this one reads, your analogy is a sloppy menace. Um, I've been investigating the language of analogy in comparison for quite some time, and I'm deeply invested in the ways, or interested rather, in the ways in which uh, comparison language um, uh, can uh, sort of remove nuance. So when people say this uh, experience is just like this, me really being interested in the ways in which analogy, comparison, metaphor can be um, sloppy and menacing uh, if we're not mindful of uh, what does it mean to, to create sort of um, a, a sloppy equation or a sloppy comparison. Um, and then I think we're getting to the end of this before we're going to just look at the proposal for the work. Uh, and then open it up. Um, this is from um, a project called Unflagging at Ballroom Marfa um, in Texas. Uh, and the prompt was for us to think about other uh, purposes or, or, or uses of a flag. And I was interested um, in sort of thinking about this thing fluttering in the, in the wind um, and thinking about notions of uncertainty. Um, and so just read strange flutters behind this cosmic purse. And these are about five feet by seven feet. Oh, I lied. <laughs> thing. Uh, this is from MLK Day back in 2021, um, which just says, read the fine print. Um, I, I've, I've spoken about this um, at length and, uh, and sort of across many conversations, but I am also am interested in sort of the romanticization of particular historical moments uh, and the romanticization of particular historical figures and my interest in encouraging folks to read the fine print. Um, and I think reading the fine print is a prompt around close reading, but also a prompt around uh, sort of looking at the subtext. Um, yeah, and I, and I think, and part of, of thinking about this, um, of reading the fine print, um, what does it mean to be a perpetual learner? What does it mean to study? Um, but what does it also mean um, to recognize that there's always an opportunity to sort of get uh, into the nitty gritty and nuance of something? So um, I said all that <laughs> to say that um, this is sort of a preamble for understanding uh, what the proposal for the, for the uh, abolitionist place will be. So again, this is the location um, and yeah, let's get into it. So uh, as I said, this project falls under the In Pursuit of Freedom uh, public history project, which as I noted before, includes exhibitions, um, performances, um, curriculum, a range of things. Um, and I like to emphasize that the work is in pursuit of freedom. Uh, and we know that this language of pursuit or pursuing implies that we're chasing after something that we don't currently have, right? Um, and so what becomes important in thinking about this work and what my contribution will be is understanding that the contribution is about the fact that our work is not done and the questions that we can pose um, in that process. So in pursuit of freedom, uh, what are we still, what, what is the unfinished work here? Um, and so I like to um, pull uh, this excerpt from Audre Lorde. I'm um, sorry, her name is not on here currently, but it's from Audre Lorde. Uh, she delivered um, a speech in 1982 called Learning from the 60s at Harvard University. Um, and I really like this speech. I've read it several times, but I really like this speech because I think in a lot of ways, uh, she reminds us of like the dangers of romanticizing particular moments um, and reminds us of the danger um, of not being vigilant um, about not only protecting uh, the, the histories of past moments, but, but not uh, doing the due diligence in terms of uh, really investigating how those things uh, occurred and function in ways that will support the work in contemporary times. And so she uh, says, as Black people, if there is one thing we can learn from the 60s, it is how infinitely complex any move for liberation must be. For we must move against not only those forces which dehumanize us from the outside, but also against those oppressive values which we have been forced to take into ourselves. Through examining the combination of our triumphs and errors, we can examine the dangers of an incomplete vision. Not to condemn that vision, but to alter it, to construct templates for possible features, and to focus our rage uh, for change upon our enemies rather than upon each other. Um, and again, I keep coming back to this because I think that this notion of thinking about how our past uh, work 
becomes a template for possible futures is really important. Um, I don't imagine that the work that has been done in the past uh, in terms of abolition and in civil rights in general uh, were done uh, uh, just for just for the sake of doing them, right? Uh, they they were intended to provide us with a permanent uh, sense of liberation and freedom. But we all always know that at the same time that folks are working on behalf of freedom, there are people who are working on behalf um, of oppression. And so uh, with that, we must be vigilant. And so, oops, uh, with that being said, I wanted to also bring in this excerpt from Ruthie Gilmore, um, who um, is an abolitionist, who's done a lot of work around prison abolition and larger uh, conversations around uh, race and geography. Um, she says, abolition is about abolishing the conditions under which prisons became the solution to problems rather than abolishing the buildings we call prisons. And I always come back to this because I think a lot of times when it comes to contemporary conversations around abolition, there's, there's an emphasis on shutting down prisons. Um, but the reality is, as Ruthie Gilmore has, uh, Dr. Ruthie Gilmore has clearly stated, um, that, that that's not the work, right? The work is not closing the door of a building, but it's abolishing the conditions um, that make prisons possible, right? And so I think in thinking about the continued work of abolition, reminding ourselves that uh, the work um, of, 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 of abolishing slavery as a, as a system is unfinished work in that the remnants um, of, of the system, the legacy of the system are so alive and well um, through many features and structures in our society. And so again, our work is not done. It's in pursuit of freedom. We have not gotten it, we're, we're pursuing it. And so um, in thinking about sort of the framing for the work, um, there's this uh, article, uh, Black Ink, or this is, um, essay rather, which talks about the relationship between um, uh, activist work uh, and writing. Um, and so as a person who loves text and loves writing, as a person who used to be an edu high school teacher, uh, for me, it's very important to sort of focus on the ways in which language has been used um, by everyone from Ida B. Wells to contemporary times to think about the role of language and rhetoric in advancing a social good and um, making sure there's a record of said work I mean, ensuring that people have the skills and, and literacy and access to uh, read and make sense of these works. So um, let's get started. So uh, this again is the um, abolitionist place. This is just sort of a, a, a clear schematic image. Um, there are three components to this artwork proposal. There is an entrance sculpture. There is an undulating seating, which will have relief text and then an undulating seating with water jet metal cut text. So we'll go through all of those. So number one, so uh, this work has not been identified yet. We're still figuring out uh, where this will be and this is why it's really important for folks to come out to public programming. Um, this area here in the front, uh, again, as the entrance to uh, the location uh, will be an area for a large freestanding structure of some sort. Uh, in addition to this large freestanding structure of some sort, which I hope people come to public programming so we can discuss this, uh, we also have this undulating seating area um, in area two. Um, and so we focus on uh, sort of mosaic relief um, um, as an approach uh, for that location. Um, you'll see in the schematic image below uh, sort of like where this work will be. Um, and the goal here and the interest here was in embedding things throughout the park, um, or excuse me, yeah, throughout Abolitionist Place as a, a invitation to not only see something in one space, but to be able to think about the entire uh, site um, as a site for exploration, a site for uh, running into ideas and information versus one singular location. So it's sort of dispersing or distributing um, this uh, throughout the location. Um, also, in thinking about that um, and, and sort of considering um, the topography and texture, uh, there are a couple of things that we're sourcing. We're thinking about the use of handwriting. We're also thinking about um, the historic uh, sort of artifacts in terms of newspapers um, that were published during this time um, and the topography that was used. And so the goal was to think about a topography that feels specific uh, to Brooklyn in terms of uh, either signage or in terms of its use um, in uh, newspapers uh, during this time period. And so here are a couple of examples. Um, 
from the Freeman's Torchlight and the Ram's Horn, um, I put up these two, again, to sort of emphasize the role of um, journalism in this process, but also the role of literacy um, in the written word. Um, as you can see here, often the newspapers were not only used to disseminate information, but were also designed to provide support um, around literacy um, and sort of just basic um, education. Um, there's also uh, samples of typefaces from Black News, which was a 20th century Brooklyn uh, publication. Um, and I found these actually at the Brooklyn Public Library in their digital archive. And I was really interested in, again, this vernacular handwriting and the ways in which there can be indications um, of the hyperlocal context of Brooklyn uh, through uh, looking at and exploring the different typefaces that have been used in the past uh, through Black publications um, in the city. So in addition to that, um, just a sort of a reminder around this uh, mosaic and this relief, um, as a reminder, relief is sort of a process of sort of digging into something to make something else visible. Um, and with that being said, being really interested in this notion of, of digging into something, um, trying to create greater visibility, uh, thinking about the process of relooking, um, thinking about the process of close reading, thinking about processes of excavation, um, and things of that sort as a concept behind this uh, material choice. And again, just like everything, again, very excited for folks to come out to public programming um, so that we can sort of process and think through um, ideas uh, for the language that will be in this area. So now finally, we're getting to this portion, the three A, B, C, and D. Um, these areas were focusing on water jet cut um, as the process, um, and similar to the previous example, uh, the artwork will be located in a way um, that's visible from the seated area, and we're excited about the water jet cut because it provides a different uh, visual appearance um, and allows for some greater detail and finer work um, and line work of that sort. Um, thinking about inspiration again, um, pulling from my own practice, of course, um, but also, again, looking at the topography and images that are present um, in abolitionist uh, work uh, during this time period. And again, please come to the workshops. Our goal is to hear from as many people as possible so that we can construct that language. Um, and so this is sort of now me getting into this reminder again. Um, on the website, uh, which I'll share in the chat in a moment, again, for everyone who doesn't have it, um, there are several ways to get involved. There's a Google form, which several folks have already filled out and left really good questions and comments. Um, you can just send me an email. Uh, you can call and leave a message. Uh, you can visit Calendly to organize a time for you to speak to me or for your organization to speak to me. Uh, and then there's also our project introduction. So this is the second one. Uh, we had a previous one on January 24th. Um, and I'll continue to do these as long as people want them. So today is, it says on the website, this is our last one, uh, but I'll probably put up another um, just to make sure that people have ample opportunity to hear about the project and to ask questions. Um, we also had our abolition study group um, and the first one was postponed because I was severely jet lagged uh, here in Germany, uh, but we were able to reschedule and met uh, for the first time yesterday. Um, and we had a really great discussion um, and lots of links were shared um, by everyone, which I'll both uh, send in an email to the participants and also post on this page um, by the middle of the week. And then on Sunday, February 20th, we'll have another group. Um, as always, I'll just keep adding dates um, as long as folks express interest. Um, and again, I would really encourage folks, even if you can't attend these or don't wanna attend these to reach out to me in these other uh, self-scheduled ways. So, whew, done talking. Uh, now it's time uh, for us to get some questions out. So I'm just gonna open up the Q&A uh, question box um, uh, and see what is going on there. Okay, so I see uh, tests, oh, I guess it's just a test. Uh, can you present some of your current thinking about the freestanding structure? Um, yes, it will be a freestanding structure. Um, and I'm excited for folks to come out to public programming to submit some ideas for how we can use that space. Uh, it'll have text uh, that will be included. Uh, what that text will say, we don't know because we would love to hear from all of you. Um, so yeah, thank you. Um, anyone else have questions here? 
Robin Satchel, what is the story being told? Can you clarify? What story, uh, where? As Robin is dropping in the clarification, other folks can drop in some questions. Um, I don't understand when we can offer feedback without more details about possibilities. I don't understand when you can offer feedback whenever you wish. Um, there is a form, uh, there is a calendar link where you can schedule an appointment with me. Uh, there are the study groups where you can ask questions or pose ideas. I do have guidance. It will be a freestanding structure that will have text. Um, but again, the purpose of us having public programming is so that I can actually solicit ideas from folks about what that text should be, what the possible structures are. So if you actually have an idea like it should be this, or I'm thinking about this, then that would be the opportunity to submit those suggestions and offer feedback. Robin, there are lots of stories about abolitionist Brooklyn. Yes. Like, is this a, so you're asking which of the abolitionist stories I'm telling? Is that the question? Okay, I'll wait for the clarification. Monique, what is your expectation of audience engaging with the public work? Uh, so one of the reasons why I didn't want there to be one single um, item or uh, piece in the project is because I really think it's important for it to be distributed across the park um, and across the abolitionist place. And so I think uh, for me, my expectation or hope around engagement is that the questions are prompts for people to either have conversations with uh, who they're walking through the park with or to have conversations with other folks who may be sitting near these questions. Um, so there's no nothing didactic in terms of what people have to do, but I hope that the questions are some type of um, something that instigates some further thought around the unfinished work that we still have. Um, Josephine, hello Camille, thank you for your work. Have you been able to begin thinking about remote participation or engagement? Yeah, so when we first uh, started this project, we were super excited to start doing a bunch of in-person uh, engagement around like having conversations with people <laughs> at the organizations or at the library or at other sites. Uh, and then when COVID hit, we had to go straight into remote participation. I am hoping that when the artwork goes live, that we will have an opportunity to schedule and organize things at the location. And so I'm really open to uh, talking to people about if organizations or individuals want to collaborate uh, during the unveiling of the artwork to figure out a public program or to figure out a series of programs to figure out an event. Um, all of those are really, really open. I'm excited most about that because I think that uh, art alone doesn't do something, but I do think that when people are in conversation uh, around the art that is in a particular location, this is when we start making a particular movement. So I'm encouraging, um, again, for folks to come to public programming, but also if you would like to collaborate on a program, uh, either during this process, like you want to facilitate a panel or facilitate a conversation between several people, uh, then I invite you all to, to do that. Will there be a QR code or some way to provide feedback on the site? Um, I imagine that uh, there won't be um, a QR code simply because we don't know uh, if QR codes will still be, um, uh, if QR codes will still be used far into the future, but I imagine there will be other ways for folks to contribute ideas. So for example, uh, there's the option of always having a um, link on a website that people can always submit feedback to. Uh, we also have the opportunity to sort of think through the possibility um, of having more ongoing programming. So right now we haven't gotten to the programming um, during the run um, of the artwork in that site because we're just trying to get through the artwork itself and trying to deal with COVID and sort of the delays that are caused by that. Um, but I think there are tons of different opportunities to figure out feedback. Um, Robin, I will take your, um, I, will, I will wait your email. 
Uh, Robin, can you please explain a bit more about the public programming sessions we'll cover? So uh, the, the two workshops, uh, the two sessions we've had so far have been focused on just providing an overview. Uh, one of the things that I noticed in the research process for this project, um, particularly around uh, sort of folks not wanting me to do the project, um, is that it was, became increasingly important to pay attention to what people were saying. And so I like to um, use these sessions as an opportunity to clarify. So these sessions are designed around clarification. There's also another study group. Um, I enjoyed the one that happened last night because in addition to us just sort of talking broadly about abolition and abolitionist history in Brooklyn, it was also an opportunity for us to share links. So we got a lot of really great links um, around Mama Joy. We got a lot of great, great links um, around the work um, that other organizations um, are doing and some, uh, some links on some great books and websites to visit um, around self-education around these issues. Um, and so that's sort of the purpose. Um, but also during that time, uh, we posed three questions last night around unfinished work. Um, and those questions were sort of used as a frame for us to sort of think through what other questions we might have about abolitionist features. Um, and so um, I think the public programming, I'm pretty flexible around. Uh, like I said, if people don't feel like this is sufficient, uh, for example, like I need to talk to you more. Um, I'm more than happy to continue to schedule more and more events uh, to ensure that folks feel like they've had an opportunity uh, to share um, and to contribute um, and to have um, an influence on, on the project itself. And again, uh, like I've said in past sessions, if folks would like to um, have like a longer private call, um, sorry. <laughs> Uh, if people would like to have a longer private call, you can use the Calendly link. Uh, that link will just give you some times I'm available to speak. Um, and right now, I think they're 30 minute to one hour um, slots, um, but you can just take up as many slots as you want if you intend to uh, speak for a bit longer. Yep, thank you, Josephine. I'm gonna, I'll drop that in the chat for um, everyone, the link to access this information. Give me one second. Uh, so I just dropped the link in the chat uh, and I'll also, I'll pull it up on my screen just so I can like navigate to show you uh, what's there. So uh, there's several things here. There's a description of uh, abolitionist place. There's a schematic image. Uh, there's a conversation around uh, what public programming is for and designed to do. And then when you click all of these things, you'll be able to use them. So for example, if you click Calendly, uh, it'll take you to a page where you can identify a time that you would like to check in. Uh, currently, these uh, times uh, are saying um, like new, like, midnight <laughs> because I'm still in Germany and they're just translating the times. Um, but they say 30 minutes, you can take up as much time as you so wish. Um, and then I'll, let me bounce back really quickly. Uh, the other thing is, is for registration for future sessions, um, you can click here. Um, and then as you can see, I always post the videos um, from the session so that people can go back and review as they need to. Um, I'm also putting in a link um, of the ongoing collection of articles about the project. Um, so I'm just pulling from 2021 forward um, in terms of uh, articles um, that are written about this project in particular. Um, if folks find that there are links that they think are really important for people uh, to have access to as they are um, learning more about this project, please email me and I'll put them on the site as well um, for everyone to access. Um, and I'll put up the study group uh, tomorrow after my train ride.
Alrighty, folks. Um, if there are no more questions, wait, I think something just came in the chat. Yes, uh, Todd, you can find that in the PDC uh, proposal that is actually update is up uh, loaded online. I'll drop a link for you. All righty. Um, if there are no more questions, um, I'm going to close our um, meeting. Um, I'll send a follow up email to everyone. Yes, I read your question out loud and everyone can see your question, Todd. You wrote, could, could you give an example of one possible question that might be engraved? Yep, everyone can see it. That's how Zoom works. It's visible to everyone. Um, and like I said, I'll send, I'll send a, a follow-up, I'll send a follow-up email. Um, so if everyone, if, if we're all done with questions, um, I'm going to get into my bed before it's midnight here. Um, I'll send a follow-up email uh, to everyone um, that just has the link, or actually the link will, of the video will be on the website. Uh, and then if there are any particular questions, like what are the questions going to be that Todd has asked several times, um, then I will also make sure that I'll link in the PDC uh, presentation that we did several months ago that has those questions in it. Um, again, use the website if you would like to contact me further or learn more about the project. We're looking forward. And again, if people have an interest in making sure um, that there's more programming or more opportunities, or you would like for me to do something, uh, a public event with your organization or with you, uh, just shoot me an email so that we can plan that soon so that we don't lose any time. Um, but otherwise, I hope everyone has a lovely evening um, and you know where I'm at. So send me an email or a message uh, if you ever need to. Take care. Bye. Recording stop.